Thank you very much, Pete. And I don't know how to follow that, except that I know where the bodies are buried in terms of early CIFA conferences. Um, if I was speaking in Canberra, I would start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. I'm not sure that acknowledging the British aristocracy has quite the same flavour, but I would like to actually start, I was thinking about who I'd like to acknowledge, and I'd like to acknowledge my friend and compatriot from the old IFA days, Caroline Wickham-Jones who is an absolutely wonderful, inspiring, joyful archaeologist. And I was so saddened to hear of her death. Um, but I think it's just worth, in the spirit of acknowledgement, reminding ourselves of people like Caroline and what she brought to our profession and the contribution she made. So today, thinking about archaeology, the value of archaeology. Value and values is something that has obsessed me for the last, I think, 30 or 35 years. Um, just to let you know, I've also got a Brompton bicycle, if anybody watches W1A. Um, but it's wonderful to see at the conference at CIFA 2022 that thinking about value and values is not just a kind of weird thing that a few of us do, but it's become a really core mainstream part of what all of us are doing in the archaeology field. And this is just some of the sessions that are on at the session at the conference at the moment. I've been lucky enough to be in um, some papers, and they've all been incredibly inspiring. As ever, Pete, you have you know, timetabled the sessions that I want to be in running in parallel. So for those whose papers I've missed, I'm sorry, but I'm looking forward to really catching up on, on the video. But this, the way in which we're talking about value, not in terms of forensic value of archaeology, it's contribution in planning, we've heard about social value, we've heard about the meanings of objects, we've, put, we've heard about hearing, putting public benefit at the centre of things, um, we've got sessions to come on ethics and ethical values, which are just as much a part of value as social value and other things. And in particular, we've got that fundamental question running behind the conference of how do we add value and how do we make it make a difference? And we can see that the theme of value is also coming out in so many of the CIFA publications. There's a, the brilliant new paper, professional paper, um, practice paper on public benefit, which I think is really inspiring, a lot of great ideas. There are values embedded in the CIFA strategy. There's all the interesting work about how archaeology can add value to construction. And of course, inevitably, once you start talking about the value of what you do, you instantly into thinking about how we do it and where we go from there. It's a funny how conversations about value lead you into much more strategic places. And some of those documents at the bottom where we're thinking about the future of archaeology and where we might go are really built around these concepts of archaeology, of value. And it's not just us that's talking about value and values. We've got, of course, the, at the moment, the new DCMS project on culture and um, heritage capital that's looking to try and put proxy financial values onto cultural and heritage assets. And before you run screaming from the hills and saying, never, 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 this kind of initiative is actually incredibly important because it's about trying to get cultural and heritage around the top table at some of those key high-level strategic decision-making about the allocation of resources. And if that means giving things proxy financial values, so be it. So it is an important initiative, and it is one that we need to think about. And I'm sorry to Adala for that rather horrible screenshot. Um, but what I want to talk about today is this idea that values are not just a tick box. It's not just something to do because we, as my younger son used to say, because I have to. It's a box to tick on the archaeological report. But what I want to talk about is what it means to take a values-based approach. Because I think that over the last 30, 35 years that I've been involved in heritage and heritage practice, I've seen what academics might call a critical turn in what we do. And we've moved towards a, a way of practicing that puts value and how we create value and how we think about value 
at the centre of what we do. It's not just a tick box for us. It's at the core of what we do. And thinking about how we add value is terribly important. And the kind of phrase that I use for it is this values-based approaches or values-based thinking. And I want to talk about today some of the inspirations behind that values-based approach and the thinking and how we got there. I want to think about what values-based practice means and what some of the tools that we've got are. And I want to think about how understanding value can help shape what we do, why we do it, how we do it, who we do it for, and kind of when we do it and the circumstances in which we do it. So many of you will have heard me talk endlessly about my own story and my own kind of journey, but some of the, and some of the inspirations that have got me thinking about value. And I often say that it started sometime in the late 1980s when I was an archaeologist in the Ironbridge Gorge, uh, working at the Ironbridge Gorge Museum. At the time, I was being very academic, thinking about industrial archaeology and what that might mean. And we had a proposal to build a new bridge across the Iron Bridge, uh, across the gorge. And we were faced with a choice. Was it, was it the right thing to demolish the listed 1922 Hennebeek Mushell concrete bridge at the bottom and put a new bridge on that side? Or was it better to save the listed building and put a new bridge in between the two as a result of which you would see the new bridge every time you looked through the circle of the Iron Bridge? Actually, we ended up demolishing the listed building. And it taught me that decisions about heritage in, in the planning process are all about value and different models of value and how we create value. And the other story that shaped my practice and stayed with me is the story of Newdale. That is the first iron frame building in the world. It is in the process of being demolished. Why is it being demolished? Because we only did the proper archaeological evaluation after the decision was made. And that's also stayed with me, that as archaeologists, we are wasting our time if we are not up front and in there at the front of before key decisions are made and not afterwards. So I then moved from Ironbridge Gorge to being an inspector of ancient monuments, joining what was at the time, I have to tell you, even I would admit, a pretty patriarchal, um, top-down male-driven organisation, but I learned a huge amount. Some of us at the time, working in English heritage, slightly rebelled against this kind of idea that heritage was something driven by experts and people did what we said because we knew what we were doing and began to introduce these values-based approaches, thinking about how understanding value might shape what we do and how we do it. And that was the origin of um, the work that we did on conservations and conservation management planning, which was actually done in conjunction with CIFA. It was a way of getting understanding sites and places and buildings up front in the conservation process and not at the back of the conservation process and informed conservation, which is also about reminding us of the importance of understanding sites before we destroy them. At the time, Historic England was merging with the Royal Commission. Understanding buildings was something that you did as a condition of consent and this was a fight against that approach. And a lot of that thinking behind the work that we did on conservation plans, that early work on values, uh, went on to inform and shape things like um, the Faro Convention, and I was involved in some of the early discussions about a Faro, and of course Graham's work on the European Landscape Convention. So a lot of those ideas have had legs and, and continued to shape things. But at the same time, and the other inspiration for me was the work that we were doing around 2000, around power of place. Um, Inspired, if you like, by sustainability, sustainable development, caring for the earth, the Rio Declaration, the idea of thinking about future generations, we were all beginning to think about what this meant for heritage and what this meant for our own practice. And we launched this Power of Place initiative for English Heritage. We consulted over 100 organisations, everybody from the Black Environment Network to community groups to different um, organisations, and we had this huge conversation about heritage and how we might do it and the value of it. And we were really trying to embed heritage and sustainable development approaches to think about the connection between heritage and those wider social, economic and environment agendas and really get away from this kind of top-down approach into a much more bottom-up, engaged 
values-based approach. And it was also, of course, at the time of the death of the young architect, training architect, Stephen Lawrence, who we remember today, who really kind of exposed the institutional racism in a lot of public institutions in time and challenged all of us as the Black Lives Matters movement later did, to really think about our own prejudices and our own built, inbuilt biases and what we did and how we practice. So that was another inspiration for me. I mean, from there I moved on to the lottery, and I think the lottery in the mid 1990s when I went there completely blew my mind. I'd been in English heritage thinking very much about those kind of English heritage approaches. And when I joined the lottery, I joined a different world. Suddenly, heritage wasn't just buildings and sites, it was everything. It was intangible heritage, it was language, it was places, it was biodiversity. No longer was there a distinction between different kinds of heritage. Uh, lottery was, in, was and still is incredibly inclusive. It didn't define heritage, but allowed applicants to define it. We, didn't set, we weren't confined to listed and protected buildings. And most importantly of all, lottery put people at the front of heritage practice. We seem to have just discovered people-based approaches, but I think HLF has been leading on that for many, many years. And it taught me so much about engaging with people, about access, about participation, and different ways of working. And I guess the other inspiration for me, um, which has been incredible, was the experience, hello Paul, if you're still waking, awake, um, of working in Wales. Uh, working in Wales for the last six years, because I think that working in Wales and understanding how in Wales important cultural heritage is, how important intangible heritage is, how embedded it is. I mean, it's a cliche in the soul of the nation. It was not something I'd experienced in England. And I think it creates a whole different approach and awareness of weight on heritage and archaeology than, than you get in other parts of the world. So that has been another inspiration. And of course, what we have in Wales, which brings us back to sustainability, which is incredibly important, incredibly important, is the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. Wales is the only country in the world, I'm told apart from Bhutan, that actually puts well-being and future generations at the heart of government as a core purpose for government. And not only is it a core purpose for government, but guess what? We've got culture, language and heritage in there as one of the key goals. And it's not just a set of goals. The Future Generations Act is a way of working. Those five ways of working, thinking in the long term, prevention, integration, collaboration, involvement, also for, force you to work in different ways. So that's been a kind of another inspiration for me in thinking about values. And recently I've been doing some policy work in Wales. I've been working on the visitor economy strategy and I've also most recently um, drafted the transport strategy. And that really shows you well-being in action and how it influences policy. So those are some of the inspirations that have got me into, if you like, a kind of values-based thinking and a values-based approach to heritage. And what I want to think about is what does that mean for archaeology? Because I think all of us have moved in the last 35 years as archaeologists into a new space, inspired by many of these sorts of stories. I think, as a profession, we are much more critical and self-reflecting and questioning of who we are. I think we're much more explicit about the way we take values into account in what we do. I think, given that influence of sustainability, we're much more focused on the future and being, as somebody said so beautifully in one of the presentations yesterday, good ancestors, thinking about what we are in the future. And I think we're beginning to think about new ways of working. I think we're beginning to work much more collaboratively and no longer in that archaeological silo. So I think that we, we have moved on as a profession. I think our concept of heritage, and archaeology is a key part of heritage, is now very much focused on value. That HLF definition of heritage has been what we value and want to hand on to the future. And of course that puts value at the absolute centre of heritage. Our practice is also very varied. I think we tend to assume that you know, heritage practice
practice is just about designating sites or sorting out development issues. It's not. It's so much wider than that. There are so many more things that we do in terms of heritage practice and, and, and what it involves. But of course, values underpin all of that. That very simple statement, heritage is what we value and want to hand on to the future, actually hides quite a lot of complicated ideas because values underpin you know, what we mean by what we value and the why we want to hand things on. So for me, value is really, really the heart of heritage practice. We can't do it unless we think about value. We can no longer hide behind the white coat of scientists or experts. We've got to think about values. Um, but, um, but when we say values, what kinds of values? What do we mean by values? Well, many years ago, uh, I had the job of being Deputy Director for Policy and Evaluation at the Heritage Lottery Fund. And we'd spent, at the time, something like £3.3 .3 billion pounds on heritage. It's a lot more now. And my job was to say, so what have we done? What have we achieved? Very much like that challenge that we're getting from government at the moment. What have we done with our money? What have we achieved? So I thought, ah, simple. We just count up what we funded. So it's a lot of time counting things and trying to work out how many buildings you can save for that money or how many archaeological sites you can fund or how many... We used to measure things in you know, buses or aisles of white. But it kind of doesn't really tell you what difference investing in culture and heritage makes. So we got together, we did this piece of work around public uh, value. Um, I worked with Robert Hewson and with John Holden, and we pulled together a lot of ideas from a lot of thinkers, and we looked at how we could create a framework that captured the value of what we do in archaeology. And we came up with this tripartite model. Now, I know that since then we've had lots of other ideas about public value and English heritage has come up with different models. But this is one that I really like because it really works and it's really simple. And that says that we create value as archaeologists in th through three different kinds of values. First of all, meaning. As archaeologists, we help people to understand the meaning and value of things, and that is really the core of what we do. But when we do that, benefits, public benefits flow from that. Economic benefits, social benefits, environmental benefits, cultural benefits. They flow from, when, from investing in heritage. But the other kind of value that we often forget about when we think about this is our own values, our own institutional, personal, and professional values. And that's this third kind of value. And if anybody's ever been a chief executive or a leader of an organization, you will know that you spend most of your time on that box. People want to know that you're trustworthy. People want to know that you're accountability. Things like the CIFA ethical standards are really, really important. Quite often when we talk about value, we're not clear about which kind of value we mean. But they are different and they're all important. And we use that as a framework to think about the value of investment in, 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 in heritage. Are we investing in what means is important to people? Are we delivering wider public benefits? And are we trustworthy in doing it? So that, and those concepts of value, I think really do, are really very powerful. They inform what we do, they inform why we do it, because of the benefits that flow from it, and our own values inform how we do it, which is equally important. So value isn't just a tick box. It's actually at the root of what we do and how we work. And I was just listening to some of the presentations yesterday online, and I was kind of idly mapping the words people were using against that triangle in the papers that I was listening to. It's a really good exercise. Try it for yourself. You know, I heard people talking about, you know, the value, the sense of purpose, networks. I was in the, comp in the session um, on Project Valentine talking about self-worth, humanitarian values, well-being, mental health. Um, but I also 
heard people talking about um, our own behaviours and whether we were safeguarding people properly. So it's a really, it's a really powerful model, and you can use it to think about value in all sorts of ways. But as well as talking about different kinds of values, we sometimes forget to ask value for whom. Now, for anybody who spent time working in museums, museums think about audiences. I'm not sure that we think enough about audiences in what we do. And different audiences have got different perceptions of value. We all work in, if you like, um, what Mark Moore calls an authorising environment. I'm not going to go down the authorised heritage discourse line. I'm a public servant. I'm a public sector person. And as far as I'm concerned, my work is authorised. It's authorised by politicians, the public, peers and partners. If I'm not creating value for them, I'm not doing my job. So I find the idea of the authorising environment a really powerful idea and it helps me to think about it because it helps me to think about who I'm creating value for and how. So that's another really important part of the values toolkit, thinking about value. So that's so what I've talked about is some of the inspirations that have got us to the point where we've got, we're working in a values-based approach and some of the tools that we use, including different types of values. Now what I want to think through is just some of the ways in which, five different ways in which archaeology can create value. How we can create value by adding mean, creating meaning, how we can deliver public benefit, how we need to think about our own values, how we can address this question of value for whom, and finally, this whole issue of conflicting values. So this first thing, meaning. If archaeologist is there to help us read the stories embedded in places, how do we best add value? What responsibilities does this bring? Is this just something that we do automatically, or do we need to think about it? If you, th I just made a random list of all the different kinds of reports that we write as archaeologists. Every single one of those, in every one of those, we will be making judgments about value and meaning. It's absolutely core to what we do. But so often, when I look at reports and things like that, I see tick boxes. I see people thinking, oh, tick architectural value, tick historical value, tick evidence val evidential value, job done. I don't see people thinking about the meaning of the site and how it and its values in those wider sense. I also think that often when we're talking about values in those contexts, we've got ourselves into a little bit of a muddle with designation. Sometimes I think we're trying to redesignate the site by saying by just restating what's in the designation document. We're not really thinking about what matters and why and to whom. We're taking a very, what I call a closed approach to value and not an open approach to value. We're not thinking about social value as we were talking about in the session this morning. We're talk, not thinking about those wider community values. We're, we're not thinking about all the ways in which places matter to people. So I think that's my first thing, that when we're thinking about how we create menu, are we just taking a narrow tick box approach or are we thinking about value in a, its wider sense? I also thought, and we had a good presentation on this this morning, that we've lost sight of this idea of character. We see value and significance as something that we tick off for a particular site. We've lost the ability to look at places and think about their values in the very, very broadest sense. Um, and I, I think that's something that we've lost. We're also far too often, far too often, on the wrong end of the process. Despite informed conservation, despite banging on about this for years and years and years, I still think we're spending far too much time at the back end of the process discovering what matters and why after the key decisions are made and not being in there and informing key decisions. And this is a lovely quote. Um, from the practice paper on public benefit. We are at our best when research informs design. We need to be at the front and not at the rear. I also think that we're not very good at community engagement and listening with communities and listening to communities. And one of the reasons why I wrote this book. 
I don't think any of us, certainly in my generation, were not taught at university the skills of engaging with communities, of working with communities, of actually listening to people and understanding their values. And I think that that's a, um, it's a, it's a real problem in what we do. I don't think we've got those skills. And finally, if we're creating meaning, we mustn't lose the power of storytelling. As archaeologists, we are above all storytellers and good storytellers. In the old days, when I used to have to read archaeological reports at English Heritage, if I saw another 40 centimetres of mid-brown loam, I was going to scream. I cannot tell you how many, I used to draw cartoons about most of them are unprintable. Um, but I cannot tell you how many reports I saw that says, well, we've measured this and we've done that, and we don't really know what it is. We are there to tell the stories of the places, and that's what creates value and meaning, and that's what connects. And as archaeologists, we are ultimately interpreters. So let's not lose the power of story. So in that first box, in this area of creating meaning, we can add value by going beyond the tick boxes, by taking an open approach to value, by engaging with those social values, by spending more time at the front end, rediscovering the nuances of character of place, and ultimately by telling us really brilliant stories. But what about that second bit of the triangle, sustainability, public benefit? How do we actually public maximise the public benefit that flows from our work? Well, fortunately, we're beginning to get a really good range of data about the kind of benefits that flow from the work we do, and that's brilliant. Um, but we've got a long way to go. And I think that particularly, we've got a long way to go in the climate change agenda. This is the agenda that's, ho that's hitting home at the moment in terms of public benefit. This is where ICON are. This is where um, IHBC are. This is where people are beginning to listen, is the benefits of looking after heritage in terms of embodied energy and reducing climate change. I think we've got to, as a sector, up our game in that space and make sure we're thinking hard about how can archaeology can contribute to this. After all, a lot of the science of climate change is based on, guess what? Archaeology calls. So we are in there, but I think we need to make more of that and that story in what we do. And looking at the new draft English Her Historic England planning guidance, it's all right. There's a lack of passion and joy in there, but we haven't really got those environmental benefits in there let alone some of those stronger benefits in there. So I think we need to get a much stronger story about how we're creating value. And um, as Pete reminded me the other day, the problem with this is that quality isn't measured in terms of those public benefits. So how can we embed those more in this, in, in, into the process? How can we make sure that public benefit is not just a nice box that we ticked, but actually something that we're held to account for and something that we deliver on? And there is no excuse for not being good at it. You know, 25 years of the lottery has given us a wealth of really good guidance on how to do this kind of thing. So for us not to be good at this you know, is, 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 I think, unforgivable. And the other key thing about this is um, about embedding what we do and those wider public benefits in other government agendas. We spend a lot of time banging on about the planning system and thinking that's where we make the biggest difference. But cult heritage and archaeology can also make a huge difference to other agendas. In Wales, there's been some stunning work going on in that culture and poverty space with people getting engaged in archaeological and heritage projects. We've seen things like our Project Valentine and the difference that that can make. Um, we've seen the difference that archaeology and heritage can make to great regeneration projects. So if we're really going to make a difference and maximise the public benefit of what we do, we've got to get out of the archaeology ghetto and into those other policy agendas and be part of them. And in particular, um, I might skip over this because I'm going to be talking about this tomorrow, we've got to be thinking about the services that we provide as a sector. Uh, the DCMS project, which is looking at cultural heritage and capital, is drawing on the approach that's used in biodiversity, which looks at the services 
that the natural world provides to us. So this goes beyond public benefit to talk about services. And I think we need to really think about the services that archaeology and heritage provide. What can archaeology and heritage do for you? And I know that Laura and the team are actively working with um, the Heritage Alliance on trying to get archaeology embedded in that, but we really need to think about what ser you know, literally what services uh, um, archaeology can provide. So there you are. In that second space around sustainability, how do we add value? We've got to get better at working with communities. We've got to engage with those bigger environmental and social agendas. We, we've got to push archaeology into wider places. We've got to keep building that evidence. And um, I think we need to think about services. So my third area, practice. Our own values, the importance of our own values. The majority of the value we create is in the service we provide to the public, but how do our own personal, professional and institutional values shape what we do? I've just been having a bit of a rough time. Sometime in the 1990s, I very cleverly, I thought, wrote a chapter in a book on the archaeology of Britain, about the industrial archaeology of Britain. And last year, um, I was asked to revise it. I suddenly realized that I hadn't even thought about or considered the whole role of slavery in the Industrial Revolution. I had not thought about the social implications of industrialization, where that money came from. And what's worse, I had not read this book, which was published in, wait for it, 1944 by Eric Williams, who subsequently gave up on academia because everybody was so horrible for him and went off to be the Prime Minister of Barbados. Um, an extraordinary man and a piece of work that was trashed at the time and dismissed as populist, but is an incisive understanding of, literally, the role of slavery in capitalism. And I had not read it, and I had not understood it, and I had not thought of it. So uh, it's an example of we all need to challenge our own biases. We need to look at the stories that we're not telling and the stories that we're not seeing. And we need to think about our own values in what we do. And this is um, a slide which I unashamedly stole from one of the presentations yesterday because it was so utterly brilliant, thinking about ableism in archaeology. Again, this is about our own attitudes as a profession and our own behaviours and challenging our own behaviours. We need to be willing to change, challenge our own behaviours and how we think. I used to think, yeah, 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 tick, inclusion, job done. It's not good enough. It's not good enough. We've got to think about the way we do things and we've got to do things in, in, in new ways. And equally, and this is another slide from um, one of the presentations yesterday, the writing's probably too small to read, but it was, um, again, talking about working with veterans and safeguarding and asking, do we as a profession really have the skills and the abilities that we need to safeguard? If we're going to say that we're going to be delivering public benefit, if we're going to be working with... Um, people who've been through experiences that we can't even imagine, do we really have the skills to do that? Do we really know what we're doing? And these are the things, sorts of things that we need to challenge. And we also need to be think aware of our own brand and our own brand values. I cannot sometimes bear the way we write about archaeology. We use this formal, top-down, authoritarian language that it's uninspiring, it, oh, don't, don't even get me started. Um, but we also need to think about our brand and how we, uh, I worked in museums for a long time, I did a rebranding exercise, I learned a lot about the importance of your brand, your language and your image and how you talk about what you do. And I think we need to be thinking about this. And that's just some of the work that we did in the museums. And realizing that there are whole, 
generations of people out there who are doing the sorts of who are interested in the sorts of things that we we're doing, but are just not connecting because of the way that we talk about what we do and how we do it. So there's so a lot to think about in that space. So in that third area of our own values, we need to challenge our own values. We need to recognise the limits to our competence. Um, we need to take things like governance seriously. We need to question our language and image. And I also put in um, something about being activists engaged because I know there's a session on, on, on activism and archaeology. And I think that's really Im important that we're out there and campaigning and, and, and being activists. The fourth area, this question of value for whom. It, you know, do we think enough about who we're creating value for and how we do that? I always put this slide up in every talk I, I'm at. I was really lucky in the 1990s to hear Professor Stuart Hall talk about culture and heritage. And this quote, heritage is a powerful mirror. Those who don't see themselves reflected in it are, are therefore excluded stayed with me forever. And it reminds us of the responsibility of what we do and how we do it. Um, fortunately, things like um, the Heritage Lottery have really forced us to put people first, to learn to work with different communities, to look at exclusion, to recognise areas that don't see themselves as having a, a heritage, and to really broaden out that concept of heritage. So I think we're moving in that space. But I'm not sure that we always think about all of our audiences. And again, I just took that little diagram earlier and mapped. Try it for yourself. Try doing it. Take that, those four circles and think about the authorising environment for your own practice. Who are the key people that enable you to do what you do, whether it's in journalism, whether it's running this, the archaeology, um, CIFA, or whether it's operating as a Welsh Archaeological Trust. Who enables you to function? Who funds you? Who are your peers? Who are your partners? We think about value for whom often in terms of an amorphous public, but it's more than that. It's about those other people that we need to work with to get our jobs done, and we need to think about what value they want from us. They might not be our values, but they are really important. At the moment, the government is talking about public value. This is the Michael Barber review. Now, it's certainly not my vision of public value, and it's certainly not the way I would like to think about public value, and it's a fairly reductionist, monetist, whatever, approach to public value. But that is how the government is thinking. And quite frankly, if I want the government to support me and my work, I need to make sure that I can express things in their terms. It doesn't mean that I necessarily have to think that way, but I need to show them how I'm creating value in their terms. And one of the things I often say in training is, if you're thinking about values, use other people's language. Don't be afraid to use other people's language. It won't kill you, and you might sometimes achieve what it is that you need to achieve. And, of course, understanding that other people's values. So this book, if you like, was something that I put together uh, that's tried to draw on all of that experience of trying to use values in different areas of heritage practice, using values in decision-making, using values in site management, using values in interpretation, using values in organisational leadership, using values in um, advocacy. Value comes into all of it. But unless we're listening to people and engaging with people and understanding their values, we can't do our job. So on that, um, that issue of value for whom, think about your authorising environment. Think about how you create value for whom. Think about what people need. Think about what your clients need. How often do I see archaeological reports that don't think about the needs of the client. I'm going to have a word with you after about the standard on that because, sorry, <laughs> just saying. Um, never assume that you know what people want. Work in partnership with people and this is about recognising that we need new skills to do this kind of thing. And then finally, finally, I just want to get um, 
to my last point, which is at the end of the day, heritage practice is always about conflicting values. We have this idea that we just say what's valuable, job done. It's not. Heritage practice is conflict between different kinds of values. And I don't know how well we acknowledge or work with or recognize conflicting values. Um, but it's incredibly important. There are always conflicting values. Every heritage decision that we're involved with or deal with involves a conflict of values, whether or not we agree with them. And um, interestingly, this week, Mungo Man and Mungo Lady have just been reburied, something that I think would have been unconscionable in the 1970s when I was studying Paleolithic archaeology because those bones have got a huge importance for the indigenous communities and we've completely changed the way we think about the value of those bones. And it's an example of the way that we're changing as a profession. But that being said, we still stuff up. And I'm working in Australia at the moment and we have just managed to blow up a 46,000-year-old cave it was entirely legal. We went through all the proper archaeological processes and it still happened. It was a conflict of value between the value of the mining resource and the indigenous value of the site. Every box was ticked in terms of the legislation and we failed. So conflicts, conflicting values, and our own complicity in that is really, really important. And we still do stuff up. Um, and those values, cultural value has got an incredibly important and powerful role to play in conflict resolution. I don't know if any of you have seen the new Getty publication that came out looking at um, cultural value in conflict resolution. But if you think about the number of wars that have started because of conflict of different values for a particular cultural site, you realise that when we're talking about values and conflicting values, we are talking about incredibly powerful forces and things that are extraordinarily important <coughs> to people. And that is a huge responsibility to take on. So, for me, recognising that there are always going to be conflicting values and part of our practice, our values-based practice, is about understanding, working with, negotiating and recognising and being aware of that is really critical. It's not, and I'm sorry, I don't like managing significance in decision-making in the historic environment. Um, I find it a really difficult document. I find it a very top-down authoritarian tick box. One, I far prefer the Welsh version quite frankly. I don't, I'm, I'm looking again at Paul for this one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, she always get it right. Um, it's not about telling people what's, matter, what's important and then telling them what to do. It's about a negotiation between different values and understanding those different values. And we've got to be much, much better about that. So I think that's really kind of my final this final point that we've got to recognise that value isn't just something that plonks down, job done. It's something that happens in the context of conflict. It happens in the context of risk. It's difficult. It's contested. It involves negotiation. And also we've got huge responsibilities as individuals if we're dealing with other people's values. So there we are. Um, just in conclusion, I think that although I've been quite critical about some of the things that happen. I think what I have seen in the last 35 years is us as a profession evolve a long way into an interesting, nuanced, values-based approach. We're all thinking about it. We're all aware of these issues. I think we're all thinking about our own practice, and I think we're all thinking about some of the challenges ahead. I get slightly cross with this academic characterization of, of, of what we do as sort of somewhat Luddite, um, you know, don't get me started on critical heritage studies. I, mean, I, th I think we're better than that. And I think that we as, we as a profession have developed our own critical approaches and we do think hard about what we do. And I think we do challenge established models. I do think we think about whose values. 
We know there are limits to the policy toolkit, but we work with them. I think you know, we don't necessarily see ourselves as experts telling people what to do. We do, I think all of us, learn from the people that we work with. I think we are, for those of us that I've worked with, you know, certainly the people I work with, are hugely committed to this idea of public service and public value and working in the public environment. I think we do recognise that we are in a privileged position. Um, I think we're beginning to acknowledge our own implicit biases. And I hope that what we do is founded on listening, compassion and respect. So that for me is what values-based practice is. That is the critical turn that I think that we've all been through as a collective journey over the last 35 years that I've been lucky enough to work in the profession. And I'm really proud of what we've done and where we've got to and where we're going. Me, as for me, I've, um, as Pete mentioned, I'm heading back to university. It's a bit scary. Um, I'm tackling this issue of how we try and embed um, the value of heritage in wider agendas. I'm interested in things like waste. I'm interested in things like um, decarbonisation. And I'm particularly interested in the gnarly issue of appraisal, which is what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow. Last time I was at university, it was a very long time ago, I looked like this. As you can see, I wasn't really listening in the theory lectures. I was mostly drawing pictures. This time I'm actually going to write my own PhD, which is an in-joke for anybody who knows me. Um, but the other thing that I'm particularly looking forward to in going back to university is learning from some of the new theories and approaches that have emerged, and particularly the experiences and lessons and insights of indigenous archaeology. Because I think some of those concepts of country and belonging and place and connection and management have got a huge amount to teach us and prefigure ideas of sustainability by a good 46,000 years. So thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being here. And thank you to everybody else who's given such inspiring papers at the conference. It's been such fun listening. <laughs>